Good morning, and welcome to St. Andrew's Cathedral on the traditional and unceded territory of the Shimshan people in Prince Rupert, British Columbia. I am David Lehman, the Bishop of Caledonia, and I welcome you to our diocesan Sunday morning worship service. We gather as we do at these day, at times together apart as we come to sing hymns, pray prayers, and reflect on the readings. Today, our guest preacher is Melanie Delva, the National Reconciliation Animator for the Anglican Church of Canada, a dear friend of the diocese and a wonderful gift to the church. We sing our first hymn, And Did Those Feet in Ancient Times. Seek the Lord while he wills to be found. Call upon him when he draws near. Let the wicked forsake their ways and the evil ones their thoughts. And let them return to the Lord and he will have compassion and to our God, for he will richly pardon. Dear friends in Christ, as we prepare to worship Almighty God, let us with penitent and obedient hearts confess our sins that we may obtain forgiveness by his infinite goodness and mercy. Most merciful God, we confess that we have sinned against you in thought, word, and deed, by what we have done and by what we have left undone. We have not loved you with our whole heart. We have not loved our neighbors as ourselves. We are truly sorry and we humbly repent. For the sake of your Son, Jesus Christ, have mercy on us and forgive us that we may delight in your will and walk in your ways, to the glory of your name. Amen. Almighty God, have mercy upon you, pardon and deliver you from all your sins, confirm and strengthen you in all goodness, and keep you in eternal life. Through Jesus Christ our Lord. Amen. Lord, open our lips, and our mouth shall proclaim your praise. O God, make speed to save us. O Lord, make haste to help us. Glory to the Father, and to the Son, and to the Holy Spirit, as it was in the beginning, is now, and will be forever. Amen. Alleluia. The Lord is our refuge and strength. O come, let us worship. We say together the Jubilate. Be joyful in the Lord, all you lands. Serve the Lord with gladness and come before his presence with a song. Know this, the Lord himself is God. He himself has made us, and we are his. We are his people, and the sheep of his pasture. Enter his gates with thanksgiving, go into his courts with praise, 
Give thanks to him and call upon his name. For the Lord is good, his mercy is everlasting, and his faithfulness endures from age to age. The Lord is our refuge and strength. O come, let us worship. The psalm appointed for today is Psalm 124. We shall say the psalm responsibly by the whole verse. If the Lord had not been on our side, let Israel now say, If the Lord had not been on our side when enemies rose up against us, then would they have swallowed us up alive in their fierce anger toward us. Then would the waters have overwhelmed us and the torrent gone over us. Then would the raging waters have gone right over us. Blessed be the Lord, he has not given us over to be a prey for their teeth. We have escaped like a bird from the snare of the fowler. The snare is broken, and we have escaped. Our help is in the name of the Lord, the Maker of heaven and earth. Glory to the Father, and to the Son, and to the Holy Spirit, as it was in the beginning, is now, and will be forever. Amen. It is now several centuries since the people of Israel arrived in Egypt during a famine and were welcomed by Joseph. They have grown in numbers and have probably spread beyond the land of Goshen. The first reading is written in the book of Exodus, beginning in the first chapter at the eighth verse. Now a new king arose over Egypt who did not know Joseph. He said to his people, Look, the Israelite people are more numerous and more powerful than we. Come, let us deal shrewdly with them, or they will increase and, in the event of war, join our enemies and fight against us and escape from the land. Therefore they sent taskmasters over them to oppress them with forced labor. They built supply cities, Pithom and Ramses, for Pharaoh. But the more they were oppressed, the more they multiplied and spread, so that the Egyptians came to dread the Israelites. The Egyptians became ruthless in imposing tasks on the Israelites, and made their lives bitter with hard service in mortar and brick, and in every kind of field labor. They were ruthless in all of the tasks that they imposed on them. The king of Egypt said to the Hebrew midwives, one of whom was named Shifra and the other Pua, When you act as midwives to the Hebrew women and see them on the birth stool, if it is a boy, kill him, but if it, it is a girl, she shall live. But the midwives feared God. They did not do as the king of Egypt commanded them, but they let the boys live. So the king of Egypt summoned the midwives and said to them, why have you done this and allowed the boys to live? The midwives said to Pharaoh, Because the Hebrew women are not like the Egyptian women, for they are vigorous and give birth before the midwife comes to them. So God dealt well with the midwives, and the people multiplied and became very strong. And because the midwives feared God, he gave them families. Then Pharaoh commanded all his people, Every boy that is born to the Hebrews you shall throw into the Nile, but you shall let every girl live. Now a man from the house of Levi went and married a Levite woman. The woman conceived and bore a son, and when she saw that he was a fine baby, she hid him three months. But when she could hide him no longer, she got a papyrus basket for him and plastered it with bitumen and pitch. She put the child in it and placed it among the reeds on the bank of the river. His sister stood at a distance to see what would happen to him. The daughter of Pharaoh came down to bathe at the river, while her attendants walked beside the river. She saw the basket among the reeds and sent her maid to bring it. When she opened it, she saw the child. He was crying, and she took pity on him. This must be one of the Hebrews' children, she said. 
Then his sister said to Pharaoh's daughter, Shall I go and get you a nurse from the Hebrew women to nurse the child for you? Pharaoh's daughter said to her, Yes. So the girl went and got the child's mother. Pharaoh's daughter said to her, Take this child and nurse it for me, and I will give you your wages. So the woman took the child and nursed it. When the child grew up, she brought him to Pharaoh's daughter, and she took him as her son. She named him Moses, because, she said, I drew him out of the water. The Word of the Lord. Thanks be to God. Our next hymn is You Are My All in All. Please join us as we sing. Paul has concluded the doctrinal section of his letter. He now turns to practical application of the gospel. He first tells us how we are to behave in the Christian community. The second letter is written in Paul's letter to the Romans, beginning in the 12th chapter at the first verse. I appeal to you, therefore, brothers and sisters, by the mercies of God, to present your bodies as a living sacrifice, holy and acceptable to God, which is your spiritual worship. Do not be conformed to this world, but be transformed by the renewing of your minds, so that you may discern what is the will of God, what is good and acceptable and perfect. For by the grace given to me, I say to everyone among you, not to think of yourself more highly than you ought to think, but to think with sober judgment, 
each according to the measure of faith that God has assigned. For as in one body we have many members, and not all the members have the same function, so we who are many are one body in Christ, and individually we are members one of another. We have gifts that differ according to the grace given to us, prophecy in proportion to faith, ministry in ministering, the teacher in teaching, the exhorter in exhortation, the giver in generosity, the leader in diligence, the compassionate in cheerfulness. The word of the Lord. Thanks be to God. Our gradual hymn is, Christ has made the sure foundation. Jesus has warned his disciples about those who follow the teachings of the religious leaders. While they understand something of the world around them, they do not grasp that he ushers in the time of the kingdom of God. The Lord be with you, and also with you. The Holy Gospel of our Lord Jesus Christ according to Matthew. Glory to you, Lord Jesus Christ. Now when Jesus came into the district of Caesarea Philippi, he asked his disciples, Who do people say that the Son of Man is? And they said, Some say John the Baptist, but others Elijah, and still others Jeremiah are one of the prophets. He said to them, But who do you say that I am? Simon Peter answered, 
You are the Messiah, the Son of the living God. And Jesus answered him, Blessed are you, Simon, son of Jonah, for flesh and blood has not revealed this to you, but my Father in heaven. And I tell you, you are Peter, and on this rock I will build my church, and the gates of Hades will not prevail against it. I will give you the keys of the kingdom of heaven, and whatever you bind on earth will be bound in heaven, and whatever you loose on earth will be loosed in heaven. Then he sternly ordered his disciples not to tell anyone that he was the Messiah. The Gospel of Christ. Praise to you, Lord Jesus Christ. Good morning. In this part of our worship together, I'd like to begin by reading a prayer. And this prayer is from the Disciples' Prayer Book of the Indigenous Ministries of the Anglican Church of Canada. More and more, it's becoming a central prayer to my life and work, and I'd like to share it with you. Let us pray. Creator, we give you thanks for all you are and all that you bring to us for our visit within your creation. In Jesus, you place the gospel at the center of the sacred circle through which all creation is related. You show us the way to live a generous and compassionate life. Give us your strength to live together with respect and commitment. For you are God, now and forever. Amen. Good morning to the Diocese of Caledonia and beyond, perhaps. Thank you to Bishop David Lehman for inviting me to be part of your worship this morning. I'd like to begin by acknowledging that I am currently on the unceded traditional territories of the Inklakatma First Nation. Gratefully, I have received the permission and the blessing of Chief and Council to live, work, and play here, and I pray that I may also always do so in a good way. I also wanted to say that I do not do this acknowledgement simply because it's a fad or something that is nice to do at the beginning of a service. I do it as a reminder to all of us, myself included, that God's people were already here before the missionaries ever arrived. God's people were working, living, and playing with God, the Creator, as their guide before any white Europeans ever landed here. I'm so grateful for everything that I've been allowed to learn, and I hope that we can all learn from one another to create a more just future together. I'd also like to take a moment to express my sincere condolences to the Niska Nation at the death of Dr. Gosnell. Dr. Joseph Arthur Gosnell died of cancer this past week. He was a Niska fisherman, a lifelong fisherman. But more than that, he was a leader in his nation. He was someone who gave the people hope. And as the Niska website, as their press release so beautifully put it, he led the Niska nation out from under the Indian Act and into self-government. And this has been a beacon of hope to indigenous peoples worldwide. I didn't have the opportunity and the honor to meet Dr. Gosnell myself, but I want to acknowledge and honor his name today as one of the elders, as one of the leaders of the Niska Nation, and someone that we can all learn from even now. He's described as gentle, dignified, brilliant, a giant. Again, my condolences to the Niska Nation, and may we all uphold his memory and carry on the good work that he has begun. So I've been thinking a lot about miracles lately, and I've been thinking about them because up until recently, I was one of the people who kind of bemoaned the fact that God just doesn't seem to be working the kind of miracles that he had going on in the Bible times. The Fraser River, 
to my knowledge, has never in uh, recent times split in half and dry land has appeared for folks to pass across. The sandwiches and meals that our churches have been giving out and serving as part of community meal programs don't tend to, as far as I know, suddenly multiply in miraculous ways so that we can feed entire cities and provinces. These things just don't seem to be happening anymore. We pray for the health and healing of our friends and family. But I don't know about you, but I realized recently that when I was praying for healing, Really, I was praying for the doctors and nurses and caretakers of that person, that they would care for that person well. I realized that I didn't often really believe that God would miraculously heal my friends and relatives. That was a pretty humbling realization to make. I've had a hard time believing at times that God is still working these amazing wonders in today's times. But as I spent, as I have spent and continue to spend a large amount of my time with Indigenous peoples, both through my personal life and also in my work as reconciliation animator for the Anglican Church of Canada, I have been learning a new way of thinking about miracles. In the Indigenous communities that I have visited and spent time in, the miraculous is not something that is just hoped for one day, but is something to be expected, something to be trusted, something to be looked out for every day. Miraculous realities are not seen as something that happened in the past that we can sit back and wonder, wow, that must have been nice. But much like the gospel stories, the stories that indigenous elders have told me, we're partly about the stories and partly about learning what it is that we can and should expect in terms of miracles in our daily lives. I can almost smell Jesus' frustration with the religious leaders in the first part of our gospel reading today. His miracles, which were meant to manifest the kingdom of God in the time and place he was in, they were meant to show the type of kingdom of love and justice that Jesus was inviting people into God's kingdom. Instead, the religious leaders reduce these miracles, these signs of the kingdom to what seems more like a cheap party trick. They aren't asking him for help, for help with poverty, for help with injustice for help with illness. Instead, they are trying to bait him. I love Jesus' reply so much, maybe a bit more than I should. Jesus basically says, way to go, lads. You've managed to figure out, and dare I say, even believe that clouds mean rain. And you figured out and believe that the sun means warmth heat even. You've got the weather report nailed, but can we just move into something a bit more sophisticated? These religious leaders knew about the systems that oppressed the people. They knew that Jesus was creating a movement, a movement that was based around the water of life that meant that people would no longer go thirsty, and that was very dangerous to them. Jesus wanted them to take the next step, to go beyond these signs, to understand the kingdom that Jesus represented. And I can feel his frustration at the fact that they simply refuse to take that next step. This is where I think I have a lot to learn about miracles. The indigenous elders who have most formed me at whose feet I have had the honor of sitting, have never made any distinction between the realm of miracles and reality. They live in a miraculous reality. 
When I listen to them, they do not speak of the spirit world as somehow separate from this world or our current reality. The creator whispers into every corner of creation. And miracles are important, an important part of this creation, of this reality, and daily life. I'm beginning to try to have eyes to see, to have ears to hear. I'm beginning to try to see the reality of miracles and wonder what my life and my faith would look like if I asked Christ to help me see the miraculous before my very eyes. People are being healed in body, mind, and soul. Demons are being cast out in the here and now, whatever those demons might look like in a person's life. People are being saved, their physical lives being saved, their spirits, their hearts being saved. These elders, they know, they know the words of the psalmist in today's psalm. They know if the creator had not been with them, they would be swallowed up and swept away in the torrents and raging waters that the psalmist describes. That the creator is the one who sets things in place, in motion, and breathes life into all creation through his spirit and his son, Jesus Christ, that is not too big a reality for the indigenous elders I have learned from to accept. It's a known reality. It's a miraculous reality. I wonder what all of our lives would look like if we came to not just hope for miracles, but to expect to see them. Miracles like people being healed, demons being cast out, people being fed. What if we suddenly had eyes to see the angels surrounding us, who walk amongst us, maybe in the ragtag garments of the homeless? Maybe in the shoes of a struggling teacher trying to put together a lesson plan in the midst of a pandemic to help their students, the children, learn. Maybe the angel looks like a Niska fisherman. What if we began, in the words of today's epistle, what if we began to decide not to conform to the cynicism, the hopelessness, the so-called logic and rational thinking that Western European culture has imposed on many of us? What if we began to believe that God, who is so ridiculously lavish with his love, what if we really believed that if we had faith like a mustard seed, we really could move mountains. People have been wondering, I have been wondering, what our current situation means for our present and for our future. I have seen some people online talk about how it's apocalyptic, the end times of the earth. I don't know about that, but I do know that we as a church should not be afraid. I don't know what happens next. But I do know that the only thing we need to fear is our own lack of vision, that our eyes are closed or our ears are closed. The greatest thing that we as a church need to fear is that we could get in the way of God's kingdom here on earth. God's goodness in the face of what the psalmist describes as these torrents, these raging waters that could sweep us all away. God's goodness in the face of this is the one thing, the one thing that we can count on. And I believe, or I'm beginning to have eyes to see that his miracles are too. That if we have but ears to hear, but eyes to see, we too, could have a vision that is bigger than the religious leader's weather report of Jesus' day. And thanks be to God for that. 
Amen. God bless you all. Thank you, Melanie, for your inspired word. You are such a gift to the church, and we appreciate all that you do and remind us and call us to be. I thank all of you for your continued financial support of your local parishes and the diocese. And if you were not able to attend worship in person, we encourage you to send in your tithe offering either by posting a check, electronic fund transfer, or canadahelps.org. Our offertory hymn is, Oh Jesus, I have promised, and I'm sure I've picked the wrong tune. My apologies for that. Praise God from whom all blessings flow. Praise him all creatures here below. Praise him above ye heavenly host. Praise Father, Son, and Holy Ghost. Amen. Let us confess our baptismal faith as we say together. I believe in God, the Father Almighty, creator of heaven and earth. I believe in Jesus Christ, his only Son, our Lord. He was conceived by the power of the Holy Spirit and born of the Virgin Mary. He suffered under Pontius Pilate, was crucified, died, and was buried. He descended to the dead. On the third day he rose again. He ascended into heaven and is seated at the right hand of the Father. He will come again to judge the living and the dead. I believe in the Holy Spirit, the Holy Catholic Church, the communion of saints, the forgiveness of sins, the resurrection of the body, and the life everlasting. Amen. We praise your abiding guidance, O God, for you sent us Jesus, our Teacher and Messiah, 
to model for us the way of love for the whole universe. We offer these prayers of love on behalf of ourselves and our neighbors, on behalf of your creation and our fellow creatures. In peace let us pray to the Lord, saying, Lord, have mercy. Lord, have mercy. For the Holy Catholic Church throughout the world, in our diocese, we pray for the honorary canons. Let us pray to the Lord. Lord, have mercy. For Justin Welby, Archbishop of Canterbury, Linda Nichols, our primate, Melissa Skelton, our metropolitan, and David Lehman, our bishop. For presbyters, deacons, and all who minister in Christ, and for all the holy people of God, let us pray to the Lord. Lord, have mercy. For this holy gathering, for all who worshipped in person today, and for all who enter with faith, reverence, and fear of God, let us pray to the Lord. Lord, have mercy. For this country, for all nations and their leaders, and for our communities, let us pray to the Lord. Lord, have mercy. For all those in danger and need, the sick and the suffering, prisoners, captives and their families, the hungry, homeless and oppressed, let us pray to the Lord. Lord, have mercy. For those who have asked for our prayers, let us pray to the Lord. Lord, have mercy. For the dying and the dead, and for those who care for them, let us pray to the Lord. Lord, have mercy. For ourselves, our families, friends, and companions on the way, and all those we love, let us pray to the Lord. Lord, have mercy. Loving God, Open our ears to hear your word and draw us closer to you, that the whole world may be one with you, as you are one with us, in Jesus Christ our Lord. Amen. We pray for the mission of the Church, together as we say. Draw your Church together, O Lord, into one great company of disciples, together following our Lord Jesus Christ into every walk of life, together serving him in his mission to the world, and together witnessing to his love on every continent and island. We ask this in his name and for his sake. Amen. The Collect for this day, together may we pray. Almighty God, we are taught by your word that all our doings without love are worth nothing. Send your Holy Spirit and pour into our hearts that most excellent gift of love, the true bond of peace and of all virtue. Through Jesus Christ, our Lord, who lives and reigns with you and the Holy Spirit, one God, now and forever. Amen. And now, as our Savior Christ has taught us, we are bold to say in the language closest to our hearts. Our Father, who art in heaven, hallowed be thy name. Thy kingdom come, thy will be done on earth as it is in heaven. Give us this day our daily bread and forgive us our trespasses, as we forgive those who trespass against us. And lead us not into temptation, but deliver us from evil. For thine is the kingdom, the power, and the glory, for ever and ever. Amen. Thank you for joining us today as we come together to worship God in this way. Thank you for all who helped with our worship 
especially to Melanie Delva, our preacher, and for her words of encouragement that are, she's always so inspirational. We encourage you to continue in prayer Monday to Saturday at 8 a.m. You can join Pastor Don from St. Mark's in Dawson Creek for morning prayer. At 12.15, come back to the cathedral uh, virtually for midday prayer with the Dean. Or join me nightly at 9 p.m. for Compline on Facebook, 9.30 on Vimeo and YouTube. May the peace of God, which passes all understanding, keep your hearts and minds in the knowledge and love of God and of his Son, our Lord and Savior, Jesus Christ. And the blessing of God Almighty, the Father, the Son, and the Holy Spirit be with you this day and forevermore. Amen. Now let's go into the week with a browsing hymn as we shout to the Lord. go forth with shouts of joy for our Lord. Thanks be to God.